All right. <clears throat> uh, if I just speak, can everyone hear me, or do I need the mic? <coughs> we'll try. All right, good. Well, it is uh, an, an honor to be here at the beginning of uh, this, this project. And uh, my theme is going to be entrepreneurial education. Uh, part of that is meant to be conversation starter for this Jefferson dinner, but just listening from dinner, I don't think conversation starting is a problem <laughs> right, with, uh, with this group. But uh, serious times in some respects, and I want to draw attention to this adjective that I've titled here, entrepreneurial education, and why the emphasis on that and how it's going to connect up with Reliance College mission. Now, in one sense, education is old news. Right? Human beings are human beings. We have a big brain, and we survive to the extent that we learn to use our brains well. Unlike other animal species, we're not particularly fast or hardy or tough. Right? We whine about the weather. Right, and we're about to switch from whining about the cold to whining about the heat uh, very, very quickly. But we are smart, or we are potentially smart, and uh, training our capacity to be smart and guide our actions on the basis of that over the course of our long life, that is essential to who we are as human beings. All human beings the world over, every single generation going back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, have confronted the challenge of education. Even so, I want to start off by suggesting that this time really is different, that we do live in a different era. My first slide is going to say revolutionary times. Right? And that the challenges and opportunities with respect to education really are different now in the modern world, and particularly in the last generations of the modern world. World. So what do I mean by that? Now here is a chart. Apologies to the people in the back of the room. Let me just talk through a little bit of it. This is world GDP just over the last two millennia. So you talk to the anthropologists, they'll say human beings have been around for two, three hundred thousand years. So this is perhaps one percent of human history, two thousand years uh, along the, the timeline here. Uh, it's divided Year one, so this is Roman Republic transitioning to Roman Empire. Uh, religious history, lifespan of Jesus, as 2,000 years ago. 500 years ago, or 500 years, 1,000, 1,500, 2,015. The line represents GDP. So this is all of the best social science calculations about how much was produced in the world. Uh, and Basically, at this scale, it looks like it's zero. Uh, but really, it was like maybe 200 or 300 US dollars per year per person around the world. And same 500 years later, the same 1,000 years later, the same, it's actually starting to go up a little bit 500 years ago in the year 1500. If you were to go back another 2,000 years, it would be a flat line close to zero. Another 2,000, 2,000, you go around the room right, with this big chart, flat, subsistence level living. You can only consume what you have produced. And so on average, people were producing little, consuming little. And that, of course, also explains, I don't have this here, but why life expectancy for most of human history was 25 to 30, and then uh, by the time we get to here, it's around 30 to 35, in, depending on where you are. But what's interesting, though, about this is you start to see 1,500, the line starts to ch change. The slope goes up, and it goes up a little more, and it goes up until you get to this point here where it's significant. It's up to now <clears throat> um, probably six to $700 per person per year. And that doesn't sound like very much, but that's a tripling or a quadrupling of people's income, and that is significant in that chunk of time. But then look what happens starting around 1700, 1750 or so, the line goes vertical. Never happened before in human history. Why did that happen? That's a revolution. And uh, perhaps the most important question in social science and history of social science is for human beings, figuring out why that happened, why it happened then, 
and why it didn't happen, say, back here, right, and so forth. And if we think this is a good thing, right, people being productive and then being able to consume more, knowing what the conditions of that production is absolutely important. And so that's going to be part of an education lesson right there, because it didn't happen by magic. We figured out some stuff, and we have to pass that on to the next generation so that they can figure out what that is and keep it going if we think it is a, is a, good, it's a good thing. All right, so <clears throat> why did it happen? And then all of those history lessons become very important. We can start to talk about all sorts of things that start to happen. Lots and lots of revolutions start to occur. Most famously, when we start talking about this, people will usually single out the Industrial Revolution. And that's absolutely correct and, uh, and it makes sense. Uh, starting in the 1700s, an enormous amount of inventiveness occurring mostly in England. And again, why it was happening in England is an interesting question. Why it wasn't happening in Botswana right, or Mongolia. So something special is happening in England. And then all of that inventiveness uh, coalesces into what we call the Industrial Revolution, large-scale energy, large-scale manufacture. And so we're producing huge amounts of stuff. It's more uniform, higher quality, lower cost, and so on. And that's a big part of the project uh, and a big part of the explanation. And it's the British Industrial Revolution. But more broadly speaking, we can say there was a scientific revolution that had occurred starting perhaps in the 1500s with thinkers like Copernicus and Vesalius, and again, picking up steam in the 1600s with Galileo and Newton and other thinkers like that. And so we start to have an intellectual revolution, figuring out all sorts of stuff about the world on an unprecedented scale. And of course, a lot of that abstract science feeds into a lot of the engineering and feeds into the Industrial Revolution as well. So we can put those timelines in there. But it's also interesting, if we talk about the 1700s, there were political revolutions. Very dramatic revolution. Obviously, the American Revolution, we know about that one. We know about the French Revolution a few years later, more disastrous, but some of the same ideals. And both of those transformed the North American continent and the European continent uh, in various ways. So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, also this issue of equality in various ways. But those as widespread ideals for all human beings to aspire to as a matter of right and limiting the powers of governments, blowing away the feudal privileges, lessening the influence of tribalism that had been dominating for centuries, brand new way of doing politics. And the extension of that, for the first time in human history in the 1700s, the idea that women too can have liberty and should have equal rights and so forth, never happened before. Uh, another revolution in social matters. In the 1700s also, again, for the first time in human history, lots of people saying there's something wrong with slavery. Right? It's, it's hard for us to imagine, <laughs> but almost all of human history, people had no problem particularly with slavery. You know, they didn't want to be slaves, right? but uh, as a matter of principle, you know, if they were able to get out of slavery and become slave owners themselves, sure, that's no problem. So the idea on principle, there's something wrong morally and politically with slavery. And so the expansion of women's rights, the elimination of slavery combined with these political revolutions, the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, we could add all of the literacy and so on. So this is all fascinating social science and this is part of what a good education will consist in, knowing why we are living in the revolutionary times that we are, that we are living. And if we think the fruits of that are good, uh, knowing why those fruits result from those prior consequences. So if you were to try to do that uh, you know, travel in time capsule experiment that we sometimes like to do, and imagine going back to 1400, 1500, before Columbus crossed the ocean, uh, we could also mention the way we do religion now in the modern world, right? Uh, after Protestant Reformation and so forth and separation of church and state. Again, unprecedented. It's a do-it-yourself kind of enterprise in, in human history. Some things 500 years ago would be recognizable to us if we popped out of the time machine. But 
huge amounts of it would be alien to us. And the mindset about how we think about women, how we think about slavery, how we think about religion, the status of science, our political obligations, and not even the concept of political rights even yet being developed. It was an alien intellectual and cultural world significantly. Right. Now, we might say you know, on this chart we're producing a huge amount of stuff, but what about who gets all of that stuff? Maybe it's just a small percentage of people who are producing all of the wealth and enjoying all of the wealth. Uh, it's also the case that uh, uh, people are uh, at the lowest end of the economic spectrum, also enjoying unprecedented life uh, increases economically, lifespan uh, in terms of their health and in terms of income as well. And this is just uh, going to be the lifespan of many of the people in this room. This just goes back to 1970s. But uh, this is to say, 1970, about 27% of the world lived in poverty, and this is the standard definition of poverty that's uh, that used by most economists in World Bank and so forth, living on a dollar a day. 27% of the world over the course of the last 50 years, basically that number has gone down to less than 5%. That historical reduction of poverty never happened before in human history. Right? We think of poverty as a problem of a few people and it's a problem that can be solved and should be solved. And even that way of thinking about poverty is a revolutionary way of thinking about poverty. And where that idea comes from and why it's a part of our culture is also part of, part of education. Now this is just to go back to 1970. If you were to go back to 1800 and use the same measure of poverty, it would be about 93 to 95% of the world's population is living in strong poverty. And that had been the way it had been for most of human history. So we are rich. We are relatively free. We live a long time. And all of those things are revolutions that have occurred. and We're the beneficiaries of them. And we, of course, know that we need to understand them and figure out how to transmit those accomplishments to the next generation so they can carry the mantle forward and hopefully do even better things than we, than we did. Now, <clears throat> what does this have to do with entrepreneurship or entrepreneurism? And now I want to make an intellectual connection. I want to take the concept of entrepreneurship, which we're familiar with from a business context. So you think of you know, your stereotype Steve Jobs or whoever comes up with an idea, but they have their own idea. And that's already an important thing. What I'm going to do in my economic life is follow my own idea, as opposed to, which is also fine, somebody else has had an idea and has created a business and has created a job opportunity, and I will take that job opportunity and do what they tell me. And that can be a perfectly legitimate way of making a living. But the entrepreneur has his or her own idea, and it's important to the entrepreneur that it's his or her own idea. And that person then has initiative to try to experiment with the idea, <coughs> and then hopefully to make the idea become a reality. Usually there's lots of trial and error. Instead of following just someone else's recipe, it takes a certain amount of guts because there's risk associated with it instead of working for someone else who carries the bulk of the risk and so on. And of course there's the upside, which is if the idea works, you get the lion's share of the profit and you get even more pride of accomplishment than you get typically when you're working for someone else. So take that concept of being entrepreneurial, which we're familiar with in the business context, and think about some of these revolutions. Being a scientist is being entrepreneurial. It's saying the received ways of thinking about things. I'm going to challenge them and question them. I'm going to try to discover new things. Right? And I'm going to do a lot of trial and error, and there's a lot of risk of failure and so forth. But it's an intellectual entrepreneurism that you are engaged in. Or the idea of religion in the modern world, where now we say to people, typically, this will be a stereotype, yeah, there's lots of religions out there. Go and explore all of them. Check them out. And uh, uh, you know, accept some things from this one and this from, from this one and put together your own religious belief or no religious belief at all. We want people to function as 
intellectual entrepreneurs in the area of religion instead of the old-fashioned way which dominated, which was there is a received system and you fit yourself into the system and accept the belief system and the rituals just as they are, not entrepreneurial at all. And then extending that idea to slaves, you're going to be free and in charge of your own lives, do what you want with them, extending that idea to women, you too can be entrepreneurial with respect to your own lives and so on. So one way of thinking about the revolutions is to say that they have this common entrepreneurial theme that runs through all of them. And that is the concept that I am working toward in this lecture tonight. Now, I want to start then with another statistic, but then saying, okay, education is going to be a very broad thing. We want kids to know some science and religion and economics and history and languages. And we also want them to think about their careers and what they're going to do to become self-responsible, self-supporting individuals and put together their conception of the good life and make it happen. So that's a big part also of what education. Our culture is unusually entrepreneurial in how young people in each successive generation are thinking about just that issue. So I've got one statistic here. This is from Stephen Rogers. He's a Harvard Business School professor who tracks these things. And there are some wonderful longitudinal studies about entrepreneurial aspirations so that are, are relevant to uh, our, our thinking here. Students in the 1920s, if you ask them, how many of you plan to start your own business and how many of you plan to go and work for an established corporation? Vast majority are gonna go work for an established corporation. Very small percentage have entrepreneurial aspiration. You jump 20 years later, interrupted unfortunately by World War II, but entrepreneurial aspiration has doubled. It's doubled by the 1960s, by 1980, 2000, and the trend is also continuing with this generation. No matter how much we are worried about the kids these days, right, the ones born in 2000 or so, they are more entrepreneurial than you were, your generation was. And your generation was more entrepreneurial than the preceding generation. It's now part of our cultural DNA. Right? And if we want to keep that going, then that's something we need to attend to. But here's one very interesting statistic that uh, Rogers put in his uh, Entrepreneur's Guide to Finance and Business. So it's a semi-technical book. But 1960s, I'll read this for you guys in the back. One out of every four persons in the United States worked for a Fortune 500 company. So Fortune 500 companies, those are the largest companies in the United States, the largest employers. That is then to say in 1960, the year I was born, 25% of the U.S. population worked for a large established corporation. 75% then worked for small businesses, family businesses, and then there were, of course, some entrepreneurs. Today, this was uh, now about 15 years ago, that number had declined to one in 14. So there's been a huge shift out of working for the largest of the corporations to working for smaller businesses and an increasingly large number of entrepreneurial businesses. That's the landscape that we are preparing students for. So it might have been the case when I was a kid, say, growing up, grow to school, get good grades, and go to work for a nice big company. That's your career path. Right? That is less and less the career path uh, over the course just of my, my lifetime. So the uh, numbers have gone from 16.5 million Americans in 1979, and that number declined to 10.5. It's now around 7 million uh, uh, as a result of the latest statistics. So that's one fascinating data. What's the on employment landscape that we are preparing young people for? It's not for many of them to be working at an established big corporation doing what established big corporations do. Now this is a point about churn. And again, I'm using some Fortune 500 statistics, but this is the year 2000. These are the top 10 companies on the Fortune 500 list. I know the font is small, so let me read through. Number one, General Motors. Two, 
Walmart, three, Exxon, four, Ford, then General Electric, IBM, Citigroup, AT&T, Philip Morris, and the Boeing Company. Those are the top 10 companies in the United States in the year 2000. If you were to go 20 years prior to that, only three of these companies were on the top 10 list 20 years before. And that pattern also holds if you were to go back a previous 20 years earlier. Now, you can look those up, but I want us to look at the ones for year 2020. This is peak COVID or early COVID year, actually. Uh, here is the top 10 on the Fortune 500 list. We have Walmart, Amazon, Apple, CVS, United, uh, Health Group, Berkshire Hathaway, McKesson, Amerisource, Bergen, Alphabet, which is the parent company for Google, good, and Exxon Mobil. That's 20 years. That's our lifetime. We're, we're familiar with all of that, or even the younger people in the room. But what's interesting about these two lists is that of the top 10 here, only two are still in the top 10 20 years later. 80% of the top 10 has dropped out of the top 10 list. Uh, Walmart moved from number two to number one. What's the other one? Oh, it's Exxon, and Exxon is hanging on by its fingertips. Right? <laughs> it was number three, it's now number 10 as of 2020. And this then is entrepreneurial churn right, at the top. And what's interesting is that most of these companies did not exist when I was born. They are still relatively young entrepreneurial companies that, of course, came up with a world-beating idea and then grew into something huge. And to be on the top 10 list of American corporations, that is then to say something. And this is a trend that goes back to through the 20th century, 19th century, as far back as the economic historians have really good data for. And what this then means is that when we think about our students, some of whom are five years old and say just starting in their educational process, and some of them are teenagers, and in 20 years they're going to be 35, 40 years old or so, uh, where will they be working? What kind of companies will they be working for? And how many of them will be working for the kinds of businesses that we can look around at right now and recognize it as an existing business and what it does? So part of our imaginative exercise is to imagine that we were back in the year 2000, that might not be too difficult, <laughs> but in the year 2000 and predicting what the employment landscape is going to look like in the year 2020. Yes, you're going to be working for Google, right? All right, and you probably knew what a Google was then, right, if you were mathematically literate. Or yeah, these various other companies right, that are doing things that uh, were not being done at that time. That trend is going to continue. So there are companies right now being formed that are going to be the new world beater companies. We don't know what they are right now. We only know that they are going to come into existence and they are going to dominate the employment landscape for our students by the time they graduate. All right, that's interesting about entrepreneurial aspiration and entrepreneurial opportunity because it's different going to work, even if you're not going to be an entrepreneur yourself, but going to work at a company that's been around for a long time and they're doing the same things over and over and you're fitting yourself into a pre-existing slot versus preparing yourself to work in an entrepreneurial company. The culture is different. The mindset is different. And that's what we need to be thinking about. Now, we're all aware of robotics. If we think about our students, many of our students plan to, say, go into manufacturing. They're not going to become professors or musicians. They like to work with their hands. They like to make stuff, and they like to build stuff. And so this could be Ford. This could be General Motors. And we know 20 years ago, at this point in the assembly line, there would be 50 or 60, mostly guys, who had skills. Uh, working on those jobs. Right? Now we know this is what the automobile factories look like. There's no more guys there. Instead, it's going to be robots, and we know the trend line. Anything that is mechanical and repetitive that a robot can do, robots are being made to do those things. So for that subsector of our students who want to go into manufacturing or into making stuff, they have to be able to outcompete a robot. And what that means? 
That's our job, to figure out what that means, to put them in a position to be able to outcompete the robot. What's the mindset? What's their value proposition going, going to be? Same thing if we move from the more blue collar sector to the so-called white collar sector. Secretaries, medical transcriptionists, people who do translation for a living, even paralegals. Uh, every lawyer who works on big cases will have a team of paralegals. Here's a new case. I want you to go and research all of the precedents in common law and constitutional law going back 200 years and bring me a report. All of that with semantic engines can be done by artificial intelligence programs. All of the insurance process forms that need to be processed and so on. So again, the thousands and millions of people doing more or less routine white collar jobs, artificial intelligence will replace all of those jobs with software. So again, we know this trend is happening, and this is another huge chunk of the demographics of our, of our student body. What kind of work will they be prepared for doing 15 years, 20 years down the road? They're going to need to be able to outcompete the software. And what does it mean to be able to outcompete the software? That's our job to figure that out and train them how to do that. So I'm going to got a couple of summary points here. Uh, <clears throat> I think this shows students are going to be working at jobs that don't exist yet. And it's our job to get them ready for that. They're going to be working, many of them, perhaps most of them, for companies that don't exist yet. And our job is to prepare them to work at those companies. So we're preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist. And that is a revolutionary way to think about education. Because 100 years ago, we know what the jobs are that students are going to be working. The rate of change was much slower. 200 years ago, <laughs> it was even easier to figure out what the jobs were going to be that students need to fill. We don't have that knowledge, and we can crystal ball gaze in various ways. We could say there are going to be probably some things that are human constants. We're always going to need humans to do these things. But what exactly are those things? What is the knowledge set, the skill set, the habit set that students need to acquire in order to be able to do those jobs? And then the much larger number of jobs that don't yet exist how do we prepare students with the right knowledge set, skill set, habit set to be able to learn how to do those jobs, whatever they are? So how do we do that? Now, I have one suggestion. Uh, this is in the direction of, of uh, uh, the prompts for our uh, ensuing Jefferson dinner discussions, is to say uh, there are some things that we can identify that are constants. Right? And this is uh, uh, just a nice two by two chart. It's based on a survey from, of uh, executives, high level of executives who did a lot of hiring and senior HR people who were also involved in the hiring process. Basically asking them, when you go every spring to the big universities or wherever you hire and you're going to hire a whole bunch of recent university graduates, what are you looking for? You know, what's your, what's your checklist of things that you want these people to be able to be able to do? And you didn't just generate what all of the desirable things that you want potential employees to be able to do. And it's a pretty familiar list. You want them to be proficient with technologies, to be able to write, to have some quantitative ability, STEM skills, oral communication, be able to work with people of diverse backgrounds and so on. So you just make your, your big long list. But we're interested in a structured list here, so they ask some follow-up questions. Of the things on your wish list, which of these things do you think are essential? Which of these things do you think are nice, but not really super essential, and which are maybe optional? If the person has it, that's fine, but you know, they're not going to be a world beater. If, uh, you're not going to not hire them necessarily if they don't, if they don't have that. So that's what this uh, access is about. How many people who are doing a lot of hiring in successful large businesses said these things are uh, essential? So the things that are essential are critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, 
ability to work with others of diverse backgrounds, being organized, oral communication. These things over here, nice but less essential. Then the other question they asked is, when you are dealing with, this was mostly people hiring university graduates, recent universities, how many of your prospective employees actually have that skill set or that knowledge set? And then that's what this vertical axis is. So basically, by the time you get through university, everybody's organized, right? So it's not that hard to find people who are organized. Or they can work with people in diverse backgrounds. They know about teamwork, right, and so on. So that's not very difficult. You get up here, people who can write. Man, yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, giving you the chart as it came to me, but you, uh, that might be moving. It's a moving target, perhaps. Right. Uh, tech skills, right. harder to find right, people with tech skills. Creativity, right. giving them a problem that they haven't seen before right. and asking them to think about how they might solve that, that's really hard to find. And then math, of course, <laughs> not a big surprise. Very hard to find very many people who are proficient with math. So you plot both of those together. This is the essential. This is the ease of finding. And then uh, what I've got circled up here is the things that are in the upper right quadrant. These are things that are essential to serious employment, but very difficult to find among even university graduates. And that's critical thinking and problem solving. So one then answer to the question is to say, or the question being, what are we preparing students for on the employment landscape 10 years, 15, 20 years from now? Uh, well, we need people who can do this now. But in the future, we're going to need these even more. And this is then one point of focus. This is obviously the sort of thing that robots can't do. And maybe we can always stay a leap a step ahead of them on that one. Uh, and problem solving. Uh, now, obviously, AI is making great strides at problem solving as well. But there are subsets of other problems that we can focus on having the ability to do so. So the uniquely human value added are these traits that are really core to being an entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurs solve problems. They solve new problems. And in order for them to solve those new problems, they need to be able to think creatively and then critically about their proposed creative solutions. So it's a match between what we expect the employment landscape to look like and with respect to the robotics and AI and then the classical complaint that we get from people who are hiring lots of people that they want to be value added to their companies. These are the things that we can, in a good education, focus on making our unique value added proposition. Now, problem solving, this usually means not solving problems that you've seen before. So you've read your math textbook and you've seen your teacher do the demonstration on the board, that you can emulate that or duplicate that. Uh, and or you can look up the answer in the book, at the back of the book, to make sure you got the right answer. This is a matter of seeing a problem that is a new kind of problem or a significant variation on the kind of problem that you have seen before. Do you know how to deal with that? And so an education that's going to focus on that skill set will be, will be important. Critical thinking. Uh, now, certainly with all of the woke stuff right now, this is one of the things that's being you know, shoved under the carpet and stomped on in much of education. The uh, critical thinking means not only coming up with new ideas, with original ideas, or considering ideas that challenge ideas that you're already familiar with, but once the idea comes up, subjecting it to honest, harsh evaluation in the most benevolent sense. And this is absolutely essential because it's already hard enough to come up with Ideas, coming up with good ideas and sorting out the good ideas from the not so good ideas is very hard work for us to be able to do it as individuals. And then to be able to do that in a social context, someone to, uh, uh, you know, you have your team of creative people together, someone comes up with an idea, to have the kind of culture in which you can socially be critical with respect to each other's ideas. 
good idea, but you forgot about this. Or actually, that's a bad idea because we already tried that, and here is the, are the failure results. And yourself, to be able to say, here is my idea. What do you think about it? And when somebody comes up with three good criticisms, and you then say, thank you right, for coming up with those three good criticisms of my idea, because then I can set that idea aside and go look for other ones. That's hard. The skill set is hard, and it's hard to do in a social context. But the suggestion then is that for an entrepreneurial education that's going to prepare people for the next generation, that's what we, what we need to do. So that is part of the project. And with that, I will uh, put it to all of you to take it to the next step. What does that mean for, uh, for, uh, for education in this context? All right, back to Marcia. Thank you. Thank you.